All right. Welcome everybody to the June 22nd, 2022 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. Um, first item on the agenda is comments from the chair. That's me. I just want to say we have a very full meeting. Um, we only have four attendees so far, so I'm going to have to re repeat myself a few times on this. Thankfully, so right now we have, I'm counting, one, two, three, four, five permit hearings and one public hearing, not to mention a fair amount of other business that's made it on this agenda. Um, so we have a packed meeting. Our plan is going to be like our standard hearing format, and we might even have to condense it further if it seems like they, we're getting caught up on things. But just to reiterate that, what we'll usually do is have a very short, like four to five minute presentation from the applicant on the, the application at hand. And then we'll have a report from staff. Um, so usually Aaron or other commissioners that were part of a site visit. Um, and then we'll briefly take public comment. Um, and that will involve very um, co comments and questions extremely relevant to the jurisdiction and the project at hand. And we'll have to limit those to sometimes one to two minutes. Um, and we'll try to be as inclusive as possible, um, but realizing that we have a lot to get through on our agenda. Um, and then we'll answer any questions from commissioners um, and figure out how to move forward with the applications as we move through these hearings. Um, and I'll repeat that a couple times, I'm sure, but that was the one thing. And then another is, a reminder that we have a special meeting of the Conservation Commission scheduled for next Wednesday, which is June 29th at 7 p.m. Um, and that's to uh, hear um, the restoration plan for an outstanding enforcement order. Um, so as a reminder, that should be on your calendars. It sounds like based on the DEP response to a recent repeat appeal, we might also be trying to squeeze in an additional special meeting. Um, for earlier next week. Um, so that will be on our agenda tonight, but just letting you guys all know about that. Um, and because it sounds like this is Leroy's last meeting, thank you so much for your participation and time and um, steadfast, you know, I don't know, um, guidance, Leroy, throughout your time here. But um, because it is Leroy's last meeting, we really will need good participation from everybody, despite it being a tricky time of year. Um, so that's what I wanted to say up front. Erin, anything else I'm forgetting to say at the top here? One thing that Jen and I discussed offline was canceling the second meeting in August. Oh, yes. Um, just to give commissioners a break and staff a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Erin. I should have meant, remembered that. Yeah. And the other one was just if we could right now just quickly get a feel for if anyone would, would be if people would be okay with um, canceling that last the second meeting in August. And I can look at exactly what the date is right now. It is August 24th. Um, so we would have our a meeting on August 10th and then not again until September 14th. So it'll be a good month um, break from at least meetings. We'll have a lot of going on in the background, but is that okay with anyone or does anyone have a strong preference for the other August meeting or let I, me know now. Just I know schedules. I won't be around the first August meeting. I'll be overseas. So okay. if it's a matter of attendance, you know, I definitely will be able to join that one. Okay. Um, Aaron, it seems like with that information that Laura is not available on the 10th of August, but is available on the... Yeah, you should check with Fletcher though. And yeah, anyway, right. Anyway. I was just gonna say, let's check with Fletcher. If Fletcher can be there on the 10th and let's stick with the current plan, but if not, um, we can consider flopping it. I know for me, we don't have daycare for that time. So it gets pretty complicated and I have a feeling Michelle is maybe perhaps in a similar situation. So. I already booked an Airbnb for that week. So I really hope. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Let's just. I'm sorry. Let's... When we talked, I was like, I'm booking it now. Good. Good for you. Okay. All right. So let's roll. We'll roll with that and do what we can. Okay. So no meeting. We're officially canceling the meeting on August 24th. Whew, okay. <laughs> Great. Done with that. All right. Um, next item on the agenda, Dave, 
any comments? Or, yeah, yeah. Me? let me just make a couple of quick ones. I know how long your, your agenda is, but just a, a quick uh, round around town. Um, so lots of trail maintenance going on, on on trails all over town. We have two summer staff and bringing on perhaps two more. Brad and Tyler are the key, you know, our permanent staff uh, members out there and and you know you all probably use the trails like I do and and uh, visit them but uh, we're trying to keep up with grass growing and keep uh, trails open um, lots of improvements going on along the Robert Frost Trail continuing from last year we've got a good volunteer group uh, led by some folks in Amherst Woods doing uh, work along the the Robert Frost Trail mostly this is uh, bog bridging and and ramps from bog bridging I had a nice meeting uh, out at Mount Pollux a week or so ago. Uh, with one member of, of a, a fledgling friends group out there at Mount Pollux. We talked about a management plan and um, that we drafted about a year ago and things got kind of bogged down uh, during the pandemic. So Aaron and I hope to bring you that draft management plan probably in the fall with some input from uh, neighbors, abutters and, and uh, friends, if you will, informal friends of Mount Pollux. Let's see, the Fort River Farm Conservation Area off of Belchtown Road, if you haven't been there recently, we're planning kind of a grand opening in late July for the community gardens there. They're really coming along nicely. Um, we're working with Healthy Hampshire and other groups supporting um, uh, folks uh, in, in the use of uh, uh, and, and the access to um, community gardens. Kiosks going up there and, and gardeners have plants in the ground. So it's really exciting. Erin will tell you a little bit more about Plum Brook Pond and the culvert, uh, the Kestrel Trust culvert. So I will leave that to her, but but I think that work is is beginning uh, in earnest this week, and and we're pretty pretty well poised for that. And then lastly, we're we're taking a little second look at the Amethyst Brook Bridge replacement. You you may recall that project that you all permitted oh, a year and a half ago or so. Uh, we have quite a few funds amassed to do that. We have telephone poles waiting. We enlisted the help of our building commissioner, Rob Mora, who is, is quite skilled and quite um, experienced in building. And Aaron and I spent an hour out there with him. And, and he's he's playing around with an alternative design that we might bring back to you. Again, we're keeping impacts to bank and impacts to resource area, impacts to the riverfront all in mind, of course. But uh, there may be a, hopefully, a, a simpler way to do that bridge and, and uh, have it be there for the next 30 to 40 years. So. Uh, look for that somewhere later this summer. So those are just a, a, kind of a smattering of the kinds of things that are going on out there in the field, but uh, everything going well. Great to bring on uh, uh, young people to help us on the trails and get a little dirty and and um, and watch out for poison ivy. And Puffer Spawn seems to be going quite well already. You know, busy, but uh, well. We're also trying to enlist the help of the ambassador program, the Amherst ambassador program to have a presence with us out there at, at Buffer Spawn. We will not have the staff presence we had in during the pandemic. Um, those resources are just not available any longer. So we'll keep a good eye out at, uh, at Buffer Spawn as well. So that's kind of a quick round the horn here in Amherst and uh, uh, mostly good stuff. And yeah, any quick questions before you all move on in your agenda? No. And I'll Thank try to stay with you as on. long as we really appreciate it. all the trail maintenance. It's a lot of hard work and tough conditions. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm so used to saying 80 miles, 80 miles. That's a lot of trails. Mm -hmm. And uh and uh a lot of uh, a lot of multiflora rows and poison ivy and bridge work and whatnot. So and I will be with you as long as I can. I'm I'm on a bit of a deadline for something tomorrow at work. So I'll stay with you as long as I can and and um yeah. Okay, thanks for being here, Dave. Um, so Aaron, I'm going to turn it to you. The next item on our agenda is land management updates, but um, let me know if there's other things we should cover in the interim. Yeah, so we did receive two land use applications um, for a filming project that's going to be happening in Amherst. And so um, what I'd like to do is there, the applicant um, representative is on the call. If you guys could raise your hand on the Zoom call, I'll make you panelist so we can pull you into the meeting. Um, and I am going to kind of step back for this one because I feel like this is a broader conversation that needs to be had with Dave and Paul Bockelman and others in town in terms of 
moving forward how this will be handled, but just to, I think the idea of this is a five minute presentation to give the commission a sense of what's being requested. And then we're gonna have to carry this conversation on. I don't think we're gonna be making sort of a decision so much tonight as beginning a dialogue, so. Okay. Yeah, and if Great. I could just, if I could just piggyback on that. Yeah, um, I know Aaron will bring bring uh, the representative in, but yeah, um, the company has reached out to to the town more broadly about using some other sites within town. So Paul Bachman, the town manager, and I will be meeting with them, I believe, next Tuesday morning. So I'd like to hear from them tonight. Maybe we could pose the questions, but for the sake of your time tonight and your full agenda, I think going into a deep conversation about some of these things probably isn't uh, warranted tonight. Um, so let's hear from them and then we'll record some of your questions and then I'll bring that to the larger conversation about other sites in Amherst on Tuesday. And then and then we'll have them back in two weeks or however the schedule works out. Okay. okay. Great. So Meredith Crowley. Um, yes, that's me. Okay, great. We can hear you. Um, so as, as Dave just said, uh, we have a really tight agenda tonight, and it sounds like this is part of a long converse or the beginning of what will hopefully be a productive conversation. Um, and I think our first hearing starts at 730. So if you could give us like a four or five minute presentation, and then we'll be sure to document any questions we have, that would be great. Perfect. That sounds great. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to this meeting. I also have Audrey Loria with me, who is the assistant location manager. Hi. And um, this seems like a, um, a perfect opportunity to just give you a general overview of what um, we're hoping to do. Um, so I'll just give you broad strokes in a nutshell. And then, as you said, I'm hoping to have further conversations in more detail. Um, but just the general strokes of it are that we um, are hoping to film a scene at Mount Pollux. Um, it's a film that's going to be, as you said, in the area this summer. Um, and it's um, written and directed by Annie Baker, who grew up in Amherst. Uh, she is a um, playwright as well. And so we're hoping to film a scene at Mount Pollux and the further discussions that I'm hoping to have are ways that we can figure out how to do that logistically in a way that has um, a low impact on the site. Um, and do it in a way that's approved, um, that our presence is approved there. Um, talking about how our crew will access it, what kind of equipment we'll bring, um, how many hours we wanna be there, specific dates and things like that. Um, but we just wanted to start this conversation off um, just to let, let you know that we're, we're really hoping to be able to film at Mount Pollux. It's a, one of the um, most special locations to our director. Okay, thanks, Meredith. Um, so I guess one thing that just, oh, Dave, do you, do you have a, do, do your hand came up? Did you yeah, I just wondered, you know, again, could you give us a sense of, of timing, what month, how, sure. many, how many days you might need, how big your crew might be, those kinds of things to just absolutely. give the commission a sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are looking for um, two days of filming on a weekday, two weekdays, um, sometime between July 20th and August 25th. That's our window of when we will film this entire film. Um, and as we're um, in the coming days, we're getting closer to having specific dates. I know on our original application, we put two dates down um, just to get the ball rolling. Um, once our schedule firms up, if the dates work for you, then it won't change again unless something happens like weather, then we might request to change it. Um, but to answer your question, sometime between July 20th and August 25th. The crew size question is a very good question. Our, our crew is about 50 people. Um, we are adept at um, sort of evaluating locations where we're going and knowing how to adapt ourselves to make us fit. <laughs> um, so a scenario would be we would likely find um, a parking lot nearby that we would secure ahead of time to put um, the bulk of our equipment trunk trucks 
and then bring the equipment that we need up the drive to Mount Pollux on smaller vehicles and drop off there. Um, another thing that we would discuss in further discussions is, you know, where exactly in Mount Pollux we're hoping to be and where our crew would sort of be staging equipment and standing by um, once we're at the site. And can I just interject? We are looking at um, scaling back to what we call a skeleton crew. It's already on our schedule, which is, I feel pretty good about saying that. So mm -hmm. although our general crew size is like 50 people, we are all aware that Mount Pollux needs to be maybe half of that. You know, like yeah. we're, we're trying for as few, few of people as possible. Yeah, thanks Audrey. That's, um... Yes, so our, our general crew for this film is about 50, but when, when we're at certain locations, we know the reality of um, how many folks we can fit in a location and, and, and do so without causing any damage, et cetera. So yes, thank you. It would be a skeleton crew and we can have further discussions to give you the parameters that will stay within. You know, We can even name it and say X amount of people um, will be in this area. Um, mm. Yeah, thanks, Audrey. Yeah, no problem. Jen, I was curious. I, I know you, you, we want we're sensitive to time. Any other conservation kind of related questions from the commission that I can take to the larger conversation that's going to happen early next week? How how long a period of time would they be there? Um, good question. Um, we the filming between like prepping, filming, and then moving ourselves out. Um, we typically film for 12 hour days. We probably would not be there um, for that whole time. Um, and these are questions that we're still honing in too. Um, so it would, it would not be, we would be at, a, at more than one location each day. So we would come for essentially half of that time. Um, and I'm sorry to be so vague in general, but as we sort of wrap our heads around this, once we have, um, a very a more clear idea. We go from being very vague to being very, very specific. And, um, and we could really get uh, bulleted points to you. And once we all talk and, and agree to what you would allow us to do as well. Um, and then we would also do, you know, have a, we have a standard agreement, filming agreement that we use with all of our locations. Um, and we would provide a certificate of insurance as well. Um, and so all of those finer points, you know, we can send in an email or have an, another conversation soon. But um, my guess at this point would be four to six hours probably each time that we're there. In the later half of the day. In the later half of the day. It's one yeah. day we're filming up by the tree, the beautiful spot, sunset e times, but, you know, we would need to set up before sunset. The next scene would be in the parking lot itself and that's more dusk and night but both days would be in the later half of the day we would yeah. likely not be there morning early afternoon are you doing other filming in the amherst area we are yeah we're um we're still scouting for locations um and we're where we have a few other spots that um, we're interested in filming in, in Amherst. Mm -hmm. um, so just in the interest of time, commissioners, anything else like very um, relevant to the conservation commission, the conservation area itself, any specific questions that we should give Meredith a heads up about? Yeah, so Leroy and then Michelle. Uh, not a question so much as two areas of concern just to keep an eye on. Uh, we'd be concerned about trampling, thinking about a uh, heavy equipment like a boom truck for the camera or any sort of tracking on the ground for a camera. Also, uh, you're talking about July, August, we'd be worried about heat generation. If you have a generator going there 12 hours, we'd like it to not be under tree branches, for example. And those are my two. And okay. We would love to, at some point too, I think it would be helpful to maybe do a site visit with um, someone from your committee too, to make sure we cover all of those concerns. Great. Yeah. And piggybacking on that really quick, Michelle, it's just, 
there's a lot of poison ivy out there, um, just so you guys are aware of that. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, <laughs> but there is. With it. No, that's, mm -hmm. that's totally, like, I did yeah. stop them the first time I went by in, in the yeah. parking lot. Yep. Um, okay, Michelle, sorry about that. Go ahead. Yeah, so specifically for Mount Pollock, some other um, parties up there have had maybe porta potties, or they're going to be like food tables or any kind of equipment set in certain places um, and sort of general footprints of your activity up there. I think maybe we should establish that and just try and keep it um, centralized to certain areas. Yes, we would, um, it would be extremely helpful for us to have a porta potty. And um, this is sort of one of those things where we would come to whoever would approve and talk about where specifically um, we'd like to put it and see if that works. Um, and then as far as food, you know, being a skeleton crew, um, it's not like we're going to have anything elaborate. Um, we just really have waters and snacks and you know, and again, we can discuss the specifics, but I would envision sort of just like a folding table with some snacks on it um, and a cooler to keep us hydrated. Um, my only other comment um, just regarding our conservation areas is that I noticed that you wanted to close down the parking lot and are you gonna want no public access while you're up there? Because that, that would be something we'd be making an exception with. And especially Amethyst Brook, I mean, that's extremely frequented at those hours. And there are, you know, a lot of people that would be trying to go there to walk their dogs during that time. Um, so I just want that to come up for some yeah, discussion. I would actually add, add to that, um, Mount Pollux is obviously very popular around Sunset as well. Um, so, I, I, I didn't know that the expectation would be that we would block off those areas to the community. And we're, um, I'm, we're certainly open to figuring out a way that we can be flexible to make it work um, in, in an ideal situation um, because we're gonna be bringing in equipment and people. I know that um, the parking lot at Mount Pollux is quite small. Um, I would feel, it seems like even if we, weren't saying that we're officially blocking off that parking lot just for our use. Once we settle in, we're probably going to be taking up the whole space. And then at some point, we would like to film in that parking lot as well while we're there. Um, so I, 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 you know, I'm hoping that we can figure out a way that we can make it work where we're minimizing <laughs> how much we're taking away from public use of it. Um, and then also Mount Pollux is by far our priority. If we weren't allowed, if, you know, if we had to only choose one, if we were only allowed to film at one of the places, by far Mount Pollux is where we would want to be. Not that Amethyst Brook isn't also a gorgeous place, but it's just very specific to our story, Mount Pollux is. So Dave, um, have we ever um, closed off an area um, for public access in the past? I think that's my, just looking at precedent. I'm not sure if we've ever done that. I think, yeah, it's a great question, Laura. I, I think through the years we've done different things. We've had weddings with signage that, you know, ask people to hike around a certain area. I mean, there's so many entrances to Mount Pollux. I don't think we can realistically say you can't go up there, but it would be incumbent upon the group, the company, um, to really probably um, put up signs that said, you know, filming in pro progress, please, you know, stay here, you're welcome to watch, or have some PR people out there on the various trailheads while they're filming and want quiet, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think all of those things can be worked out. I, I, I share your concerns about Amethyst Brook. I think Amethyst Brook is, is just a much more difficult with, with so much traffic and, and so much dog walking. I think it's a much more complex situation to try to use that for this kind of exclusive purpose for a couple of hours. So, so I have a really good sense from the commission and of course, from my own knowledge of Mount Pollux of some of the issues. Um, my brother-in-law happens to be in the industry and just got back from filming in Newfoundland for four months and part of his crew, this, this is what they do. The advanced team does this. So um, I have a, a good sense of, of kind of what, what kind of things go into this. So happy to take this conversation with the town manager on Tuesday and get more information. I do think time is a little bit short um, yeah. if we want to get this approved by a late July uh, date. So, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. So I think time is also short just for our agenda. So I wanted to say, Meredith, thank you. Um, And Audrey, thank you for being here and giving us a heads up about this. It sounds like there's more to be figured out. Um, The one last thing I'll add is just in the past, and this is, I don't think we need to pull this apart right now, but in the past, Dave, when we've had somebody using a conservation area or a town property for profit, we've like figured out how to get some sort of contribution back to the the conservation area and the town. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that that is also a precedent um, that we're trying to hold on to, just because a lot of different entities use this land, and thankfully um, we're in a position to like make sure it's used responsibly. So um, we're very happy to give a donation for sure. Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we'll we'll have more next week, Jen. I, I think it's a great opportunity, um, you know, to it's 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 an Amherst native who is doing this and coming back to their hometown, and and I think it's really exciting to be able to support this endeavor. So we'll do everything we can, and and we'll have a report for you next week after the meeting with the town manager. Great. And if you need further information from us before that meeting, I'm happy to happy to put together an email and answer any further questions before your next meeting. Great. Great. Thank you very much. It would be fun to watch a movie filmed at Mount Polly. <laughs> we just have to do our best to protect that land. So thank you. Of course. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Right. Good night. Good night. All right. Thank you, everyone, for those succinct questions. That'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, So the next item on our agenda is a public hearing for reviewing um, the final changes and hopefully approving the proposed amendments to the town of Amherst bylaw regulations. Um, So I don't think I have to do anything. It's already an open public hearing. I think Erin, the plan here was that you wanted us to give us first an overview or do you want to take public comment first? Um, yeah, so if I could just give a quick overview. Okay. Um, so just to recap a little bit, we have a page on the Conservation Commission uh, website that has the um, bylaw regulation amendments with all the applicable documents. There's the existing regulations section by section, proposed changes section by section, and then the new regulations section by section. I also uploaded Leroy's presentation and his talking points um, there. And then at the very bottom, there's some there's three sections so based on the comments that were um, and also just sort of a final read through um, I did make a few minor edits to three different sections of the document and I that's what I would like to um, review with the commission and the public quickly before we um, take public comment if that's okay I think that makes a lot of sense Okay, so can you guys see my screen? Mm -hmm. So we incorporated, um, and just to to recap on this a little bit, any definitions in the definition section, um, we removed all duplicate definitions from the Wetland Protection Act so that our definitions now are strictly as they apply under our bylaw if they're not already defined or if they're different than what is in the Wetlands Protection Act. And one of the things we felt it was really important to define was clear cutting. Um, And so the commission had originally put a definition together um, and then Fletcher sent me some comments, feedback based on that definition. And so I modified the previous edited definition that we had had up in the um, on the website. So one thing that was important to Fletcher here was he didn't want us bringing up clear cutting on small lots or single family house lots. Um, And I thought that it was very important that we say five acres or greater because typically um, agricultural land or land in agriculture is five acres or greater. And so I incorporated in that five acre or greater concept. Also, he felt like it was really important that we separate out um, clear cutting that's done for regenerative silvicultural practice versus clear cutting that's done to convert the land from one use to another use. And so that's what the this change in definition does.
That makes a lot of sense. And I did send this to Fletcher and I said, I edited our previous definition based on your comments and he said, looks good. So um, just sharing that one change. And then the other one change was um, in the vernal pool definitions, which took, which takes out the um, no permanent flowing outlet and also um, no predatory fish populations because there are certified vernal pools that have both predatory fish and flowing outlets. And so um, to a little backstory on that is we did, um, vernal pools now have their own section in our resource area section. And the definition is now much clearer and much more focused on physical and biological characteristics. It's spelled out very clearly now. Um, so this definition ties back to that section. So that's one area where, now again, this is changes in addition to the changes that were already made. So we're revisiting this based on the public comment and the commission's overall review. Um, the next section was, um, was relative to filing fees, plan requirements, and work conditions. Um, this was actually an error that I found um, in, and this was the, the final draft version that was up on the website. So as you can see, under plan requirements for request deter for determination, it referenced notice of intent. And under plan requirements for notice of intent, it referenced request for determination. So they were just switched out and so I switched them so they were in the appropriate sections. So that was just a, um, a catching a, an error that was in there that I hadn't captured, that I hadn't um, uh, detected previously. And then the third section is the procedures section and this is relative to the abutter notification discussion that was happening relative to request for determination. And there was a lot of public comment that we received over the last the last three meetings where basically there was concern about the waiver provision. So this is how I changed this to address this. And just to be clear, so under D number two, we still have any person filing a request for determination with the commission shall comply with the abutter notification requirements as discussions in section 3B of these regulations. And then what we're saying here is that we are not adding a provision to be able to waive a butter notification for the RDA. Correct. Be extra clear. Right. So I see this as us, you know, just an extra layer of public input, commissioner input to try to sort of um, form, formulate these um, bylaw regulations to suit the community and the commission's needs. And so we have tried very hard to do that and to take people's comments in, into consideration. So that was, those are the, the additional changes from the final draft versions that were posted online. And those were those last final changes that were made. Um, just as a point of reference before you take public comment, there are still, I'd like to do just like a final read through, through for gra grammatical edits and also for final section updates, like just to verify that <laughs> section references are correct. But the content of the, the um, regs is what I would like to have the commission approve tonight if the commission feels comfortable doing so. We've worked really hard to get to this point. Leroy and Michelle have spent countless hours working offline on this. So if we can get this approved tonight, we would be extremely grateful for that. So with that said, I'll turn it, turn it back. Okay. Thanks, Erin. Um, before we move to public comment, I just want to see commissioners. Is, are there any outstanding questions or suggested revisions um, aside from small grammatical errors and references from one section to another section, vice versa, um, that you want to talk about right now? All right. Um, so with that, we're going to open this up for public comment. Um, again, we're please limit your comments and questions to two minutes um, at most and um, so that we can keep moving because our agenda is very full tonight. Um, so with that, I see Becca Matthews. You should be able to talk, although you're muted. 
Um, thank you. I just want to thank you. I appreciate your work on this, and I really appreciate that you're not waving about our notifications. I just think it's really important for members of the community to who will be impacted to be able to learn about the projects and have an opportunity to ask questions and express their views. And I just appreciate your work on that, and um, you know that you're not waving the about our notifications. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, Paige. Uh, are we just commenting on the bylaws or the whole night's proceedings? Just the bylaws. Okay, I just want to commend you on the work you've done, and uh, I like the revisions, and I hope you'll adopt the new wetlands bylaw tonight. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Janet Keller. I too would like to thank um, <clears throat> the subcommittee. This is an incredible and outstanding piece of work. It's a massive technical legal update of the, of the regs. Um, and I greatly appreciate your moder modernizing them to reflect the commission's experience and the best practices um, of the Massachusetts wetlands law and the wetlands regs of surrounding communities. And of course, uh, offer a special appreciation for uh, the restoration of a butter notices um, and the clear um, statement um, that you have, have now placed in the regs um, all around a wonderful collegial effort on this very difficult work. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for following along and for your participation. Um, Rolf Karlstrom, Karlstrom, excuse me. Hi, thank you. Um, first of all, I agree with what's been said. The abutters notification is critical because not just we need to know, but we also have information that can be critical in helping with decisions. So thank you for rem remembering that. We've been here a long time and we know a lot about the land around us and we can provide a perspective. So that's important. The other item, I just want to say very quickly, procedurally, please remember we can't see anybody else. And I, I still really don't like this forum where we're doing a public meeting where I don't know who my who the other people in the audience are. So remember to, to please say our last names when you say we're speaking because no one else knows who we are in the audience. And you did that for me, thank you. And, and just remember that if there was any way, if there's any town person listening, that we could move to a forum where we were more like an open meeting where we knew who was in the audience, we could do a much probably better job of coordinating our comments and thinking about how you, know, you could get more out of us as, as the community. So it's just a, a comment, we're stuck with Zoom at the moment, but if there's any way for us to know the list of participants, boy, would that make a difference how it feels to be in a meeting that is a town uh, town meeting. So thanks. They, they yeah. can't look at they can't look at the participants. Yeah, hold on a second, Larry. Yeah, so um, Mr. Karlstrom, I just want to say so we don't always know the full name. So it's however people sign or call in is all that we can see. So I read the name that I can see. Thank Sometimes you. I yeah. only see a phone number. Just so you know, so like um, we have a little bit more information, and that's only the people hosting the meeting. So that's Aaron and I. Um, so for us, we need which, to. So I'm yeah. yeah. So, so I'm remind us to say our names and addresses because that we forget that so quickly. So thank you for that. That's important okay. to remember. Yeah. So Great. I'm Rolf yeah. Karlstrom, 73 Fairing, longtime Amherst resident. Thank you. That's okay. an important point. Yeah. Great. I appreciate that. And. And noted, we'll we'll Thank see you. if there's any way we could switch around this forum. It's tricky, I agree. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I see Paige and Janet, you still have your hands up. Um, if you and Rolf. Okay. Um, looks like no more hands up. Um, if you're here attending the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting and you have any questions or comments about the proposed revisions to our bylaw, please raise your hand. And if I select you, please state your full name and address. I will work on that. Okay. 
We'll give it 10 more seconds. All right, um, so it looks like we need a motion. Roy, yeah. I think you should have the honor. Yeah. Uh, move to approve the 2022 bylaw regulation amendments and close the public hearing, allowing for minor grammatical changes and section reference updates to be finalized prior to the posting of the updated amendments online. Second. That was a second from Michelle, voice vote, Laura. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Larry. Aye. And I am an I. Fletcher is absent. Wow. Thank you guys so much. Great work, Aaron. Great work, Michelle and Leroy. That just made our lives less complicated. <laughs> you know, for future thing, for future things, they can't see the participants. I can see all the participants. I can. I can look at the whole list of all the names that are watching. Yeah, it's because you're a panelist. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that's what I'm saying. The, can they not see it? Yeah, and and there are reasons for that. Um, so like. For example, I'll, I'll just give an example, like there, there are phone numbers. And so if it was a public forum where all that information was on display, people's personal phone numbers would be posted in a- I don't see phone numbers. I just, on the I bottom, see phone numbers. On the bottom of your Zoom thing, there's a participants thing. You click we don't on see that, phone numbers yeah, as he, participants. The public can't see that, Larry, because they're not panelists. So right. they don't have right. access to who the attendees in the meeting. Um, and because there's just such a different amount of information you can get from whatever people enter when they enter the Zoom meeting, it's it's not like, you know, it's not a, a equitable way of sharing information about the people in attendance. Um, well, I just get a list yeah. of names. I get a list of yeah. all the names. Yeah, I, that, yeah. Larry, so I think when, um, when, when you press on uh, attendees on that uh, list, Larry, the, the top one that I see is a phone number. That's true. And that happens because of the way they log in. You know, that's right. true. But otherwise, um, you see the name Jen, am... they put on their screen. Anyway, go ahead. All right. Um, yeah. So, Larry, I'm listening. I don't know. this is Dave. I, I am listening and, and I will take these comments back. This is a this is a challenge for all committees and boards, including the town council and Amherst. So I, I heard Rolf's comments and concerns and, and they have been shared pretty widely by lots of other people. So okay. we're working on it. We're not even sure remote meetings are going to continue. We may be back in person before you know it. So that's what I was just going to yeah. say is that I think that there we we would need some legislation to pass pretty quickly if we were going to stay in this format much longer. So I think that's an unknown at this point too within the state of Massachusetts. Um, so comments all appreciated. I don't think we're going to solve it now. Dave, if you wouldn't mind just keeping us posted on any changes or um, any avenues to change the format for our meetings, that would be really, really appreciated. I will do that. Thank you. Um, okay, keeping us rolling. Um, next public hearing is a notice of intent. Um, 7.35, 15 minutes late, we'll get there. Um, so this is SWCA for 52 Fearing Street LLC for the relocation and reconstruction of a single family house with associated site work and preparation in the 100 foot buffer to bordering vegetated wetland at 46 Fearing Street. Um, so Erin, we have to continue this because of the open appeal period for the ORAD also on Fearing Street. Um, do we open this hearing or just continue it or open it and continue it? I would You're say, we, <laughs> I would say, I would say opening it. Um, if, because I know there's, there are, um, probably a lot of a butters present who received a butter notifications. Yeah. Um, I would say that it's, it's totally, um, up to you, Jen, with regard to once you open the public hearing, if you'd like to have the applicant, present just a general overview of the project and or whether you choose to pay, take public comments tonight, um, I would recommend that we keep the proceeding to 20 minutes, um, just because we know that it's going to be continued anyways. Um, but yeah. 
All right, well, let's open the public hearing first because we know we have to do that. Um, so this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended, amended and article 3.31 wetland protections under the town of Amherst general bylaws. Um, so the reason that this um, hearing is being continued is because there's a open appeal period um, on a, um, another project, which is relevant to this one. Um, so commissioners, I think it would be helpful if you would weigh in, if you think it would be useful, knowing that we can't close this hearing, if you think it would be useful to hear information about the proposed work um, or and take public comment, or if you think we should um, postpone any discussion of the proposed project to mm -hmm. a meeting, this would be the next meeting um, once we know, once that appeal period is closed. Keep in mind, we won't necessarily know the outcome of the appeal by the time mm -hmm. that we should discuss this. Um, Jen, I just think pragmatically, because we don't know who's gonna be in attendance at the next meeting, I suggest we have the conversation at the same time and we can actually take action. So. Right. So the advantage that Laura is referring to is that Leroy will not be at the next meeting. This is his last meeting as a conservation commissioner and Fletcher is not here. Um, so the advantage at the next meeting would be that Fletcher hypothetically would be here, which would get us closer to or cl have a, a larger number of commissioners fully filled in um, and aware of what's going on in the project. Other commissioners? feelings about procedurally how to handle this. All right. Um, am I taking that as neutral? I was hoping that we might know the outcome of the appeal by then, but you're saying we might not. So I guess I, I don't really know. Yeah. We I, probably on neutral I mean, lines. Yeah. Yeah, we probably won't, I think. Well, then I think Laura makes a good point for um, yeah. keeping yeah. discussion then. Yep. Um, so applicant and members of the public present um, regarding this hearing for uh, 52 Fearing Street. We appreciate you being here. In order to be as efficient as possible in future meetings um, due to attendance of the commissioners and also an ongoing appeals period um, that's, that impacts this project, we're going to wait and take a discussion of the project, presentation of the project details, and then public comment in the next hearing. And so we're going to continue this to our next meeting, um, our next full meeting, which I'm opening my calendar is on July 13th. Is that right, Aaron? Yep, July 13th at 7.40. Um, so if you were notified as no butter about this, this hearing and this meeting today, you will not be notified again. Instead, keep an eye on our agenda, but what we're doing is rescheduling and we'll open public comment and discussion of this permit application. Um, at our next meeting on July 13th at 7.40 p.m. So commissioners, I need a motion. I'll make a motion to move to continue public <laughs> opening for 46 Fearing Street for the notice of intent um, to July 13th, 2022 at 7.40 p.m. Seconded. So that's seconded. Motion by Laura, seconded by Leroy. Voice vote, Laura. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Michelle? Aye. Andre? Aye. Larry? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Next item on the agenda is this is another notice of intent SWCA on behalf of Ron. La Verdier, Verdier, I'm sorry, I will ask about pronunciation of that, for the construction of a multifamily residential building and associated site work and mitigation in the riverfront and buffer zone to border, bordering vegetated wetlands at 395 West Street. Um, 
Okay, so for this one, we're still waiting for natural heritage, Erin. Is that, do I have that one straight? Yes, and um, the applicant did want to present the project tonight and also okay. seek the commission's guidance relative to a restoration area that they um, are looking to, an area they're looking to restore of a wetland on the site, um, guidance, commissioner opinion um, as they move forward with a probably a, a plan revision, a potential plan revision on the site. Um, so I know Mickey Marcus is here. Uh, okay, I'll bring Mickey in. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Mickey Marcus, uh, SWCA. I'm an Amherst resident. And uh, also on the call is uh, Tony Summers, who's a project uh, designer, and Ron Lavertier, who's the uh, owner of the Amherst Office Park. Um, so the um, Aaron, uh, um, Mickey, correct, do you want us? Do you want us to bring allow Ron and Tony to talk, or just if there are any questions for them, um, you probably want to bring them in. So if they okay. they, if they have any uh, add some color to the discussion. Okay, Ron, so, um, you're there. You so there's wood turtle uh, associated with Plumbrook. Um, so we did file a streamlined permit with Natural Heritage. They have 30 days to issue a response. Uh, we haven't gotten that back yet, so we, we will just continue this hearing. What, what I wanted to do is just give you an overall um, uh, flavor of this project. Uh, and I do have a couple of questions I wanted to ask the commission for some potential plan revisions for the next hearing. So the, the project is um, taking an existing um, house that was previously used as a group home and convert that, tear that down and build um, a nine unit um, residential building. And there's, a, the building is 50 feet or more from the wetlands. There's no work within 30 foot buffer. Um, there's no tree cutting involved in the project. There's no wetland alteration, but we do have a fairly extensive wetland mitigation plan. And um, I just wanted to just go through what that is. Um, Plum Brook is right next to the site. Um, so it is considered a riverfront redevelopment. Uh, I, I guess uh, I don't have to give you all the numbers now, but the total um, additional work uh, of impervious area um, is about 4,623 square feet. Um, so there's there's an addition, there's an existing driveway, parking lot, dumpsters, building, outbuildings. Um, and that, that's a little over 10,000 square feet. And the, the total project is a little larger than that. It's closer to 15,000 square feet. Um, the, um, there's an existing driveway that goes down to uh, from the site to West Street. We're actually proposing to remove the entire paved driveway. Um, and instead, um, we're gonna build a series of um, six rain gardens. So sm very small, stormwater management for the site. And, and those are gonna, some of those are gonna be built actually in wh where it's currently the driveway. So um, you can see there, there's um, within the driveway, there's actually four separate rain gardens um, that spill out. Um, there's a lot of ecological restoration, you know, call it mitigation enhancement, but um, there's, um, Mo the, the only lawn is that very light green area. All that dark green area is sort of like native habitat. Uh, there's a lot of plantings. That entire orange area is a restoration area. It's over 18,000 square feet. Um, and then um, one of the things that we want to do is like is removing the um, the roadway across a wetland. So you'll see there um, you were. Uh, that, that light blue area near West Street, that's a an existing driveway with an eight inch culvert separating a wetland. And we're, we'd like to remove that entire fill and driveway, restore the wetlands. And one of the uh, things I wanted to talk to you about was um, the wetlands have crept up onto the fill 
So in the notice of intent, we had about a thousand square feet of wetland alteration. It's really just to remove the all the fill and restore that area um, uh, to have a better connection to the wetland. So, so I have a couple of questions, and one is. Do you want us to do that? Um, you know, do a full restoration, which has a temporary alteration of the side slopes. Like I say, about 500 square feet on each side of the driveway. Um, and there's Phragmites on the north side. Uh, that dark green area has a lot of Phragmites. Didn't know whether you wanted us to include a plan for uh, controlling that, trying to keep that out, because we don't want that to spread through the wetlands on the south side, which is mostly cattail. Um, and then, um, you know, the landowner, Ron, Ron Laverdier, is had suggested um, that maybe we should create like a raised boardwalk through there so residents of the public can go from those buildings out to West Street um, through a little boardwalk through the wetlands. Wanted to see if that you, th you thought that was a reasonable approach. Um, and a Aaron had also suggested maybe some signage if we do restoration there uh, along the sidewalk on West Street. Um, the plans currently include removal of four dying Norway spruce. They're shown on the plan right next to the detention basins. One of the things that we noticed uh, today during the site walk was that there's also a couple of dead um, uh, white pines. And we think we, we should just remove those. Uh, Aaron suggested just topping those, but but they're they're kind of dangerous where they are. And and then just any other recommendations from the commission. Um, you know, we're going to continue this. We have time to make some changes. So if I could just go through them, um, do you like the idea of just removing all the fill from that former driveway, even though it would uh, temporarily impact about a thousand square feet of wetlands. These are the side slopes from the road. Um, should we consider the idea of a some sort of boardwalk or a raised crossing across that area, little kiosk? If we want to top those um, white pines, should we put those on the plan? And any other uh, suggestions uh, the commission or, or staff have? So that, that, that's it. Oh, stormwater. Um, uh, it, like I said, there's, uh, we tried to do impervious pavement, uh, couldn't make that work with the groundwater levels, which is why we have many, we have six uh, rain gardens. So that was uh, the original approach was to try to do um, pervious asphalt, but that didn't work for this site. And this, this is the driveway that we'll, we'll pull out. That's the existing house. Um, so the access to the site will be through the existing um, office park and not use that, that driveway. So the house is on the right that will go. And, and part of the restoration in that river front, there's a lot of knotweed, multi-floor rows. There's just a lot, of, a lot of stuff you don't want to have there. Plum Brook. That's uh, the outfall, that's Ron, that's the outfall of one of the uh, stormwater uh, rain gardens. So this is the restoration area. They're standing basically um, on the driveway between the two wetlands. Uh, that's a bad picture, I'm sorry. Uh, these are pictures of the trees that are dying or dead uh, along the driveway that they were proposing removal. Okay. Aaron, um, did you have any initial red flags or concerns? Well, so I've met with Mr. Lavertier and or SWCA two or three times prior to this filing, and they've incorporated basically every bit of recommendation that I've offered to them in terms of restoration, native plantings, um, you know, pollinator uh, plantings or um, meadow plantings. Um, the restoration by the of the driveway is, was my, at my recommendation and urging. So um, I think they've in, they have incorporated everything. I haven't gone through this application with a fine tooth comb in order to offer recommended conditions, but based on what I've seen so far, they've incorporated what I've asked for. So um, 
I don't see anything that's jumping out at me as far as red flags that you know are problems right now with what they're proposing to do. Um, I think they just want to make sure you guys are on the same page with the recommendations I've made and also just get a little more specific guidance relative to the big concern being if they pull all that fill material out, are those Phragmites then going to travel north or south rather into the, the other wetland? They've <clears throat> thought about keeping a little berm in between also because they don't want to drain the wetland that's up gradient. Um, so they want to make sure that they're preserving that existing hydrology as much as possible. And then the area proposing a walk or boardwalk over there, I thought, you know, if if that's useful for their residents, that that could also be something like a public education component that could be incorporated into the site where we're saying this is an existing area of fill very close to riverfront. It's BVW restoration. It's also very close to a floodplain, um, trying to incorporate some you know, flood storage and restoring the area and give people an opportunity to understand the educational side of what we do. So that was why I had suggested that because it's so visible right on West Street. Um, but yeah. it's totally up to you guys in terms of your feelings about it and if you think it would be beneficial. Yeah, yeah. Hot take is that I think the plan looks really good and I can tell that there's been a lot of like back and forth and detailed kind of review of how to handle this. Um, Laura, I see you have your hand up. Do you have a question or an initial response to, to yeah, make I mean, questions? I think, I think the plan is really thoughtful um, and I like the plans for restoration. I think that mm -hmm. my question was around the walkway and um, and we don't have to get into this now, Jen, but the questions I will end up asking are going to be, you know, do they actually see anticipated use of that walkway? Mm -hmm. um, and and if we don't approve sort of a boardwalk area, will residents just carve their own path? So, um, and I don't have enough information about sort of the, the foot traffic around the site. Yeah, it'll be pretty wet, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. If that's the shortest route to the, the sidewalk, it might, be, <laughs> might be, become a footpath quickly. Um, yeah, uh, Mickey, if you don't mind, I'm just going to like get everyone's kind of feelings and initial reactions. And then if you have specific follow up questions, give I'll let you go ahead. Is that OK? That's fine. OK, Michelle. Um, yeah, I think it looks really good. I like the restoration um, plans and the walkway if it's appropriate. I am concerned about the Phragmites encroaching, especially with all the disturbance. So I think they should go hand in hand with the restoration of the fill. Um, and I, my question is just uh, how the knotweed is gonna be dealt with, like if it's gonna be dealt with at the, simultaneously with kind of digging up ground um, and you know just trying to prevent it from spreading because it's pretty noxious, especially can take over newly disturbed areas. So um, I guess just the, that the plan for controlling the knotweed and restoring the rest of the site is somehow coordinated to prevent more knotweed spread. Yeah, so like a phasing and understanding of kind of the phasing, Mickey, I don't know if you can answer that now, but just- You know, I think I think I need to give you a more detailed plan. Erin uh, also asked about uh, whether, uh, what the approach would be for the invasives. This one fairly large patch of knotweed, um, uh, I think I'd rather just think that through and give you better okay. details uh, okay. for the next year. That's great. Thank you. Commissioners, any other initial questions or like additional information we would need in order to um, issue an order of conditions uh, and vote on this application just so we can get, get as close as we can by our next meeting, assuming we hear from Natural Heritage? Do you guys like the idea of removing the driveway and restoring that wetland? Um, yeah. Yeah. How long has that, like, how long has that been in place? You know, a long we're gonna... time. A long time. I think the house was I... built like 50 years ago, they said. So, yeah, I just wonder, and people have more expertise than I on this panel. You know, obviously, I love the idea of restoration, but after something's been there for so long, is it more harmful to? rip it up. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. So just something. Yeah. I don't know if science knows the answer to that. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's it, 
it goes, it could go both ways, right? So removing that driveway means you connect to previously disconnected systems mm -hmm. and there's so much phragmites in that upper system um, that you risk like lowering the water level and then like moving all that seed mass um, or allowing mm -hmm. transport of that seed mass into the previously disconnected mm -hmm. wetland. Mm -hmm. Um, but that said, if you connect them, then it's flood storage. That whole thing becomes flood storage and like an active mm -hmm. floodplain for Plum Brook. So maybe, I mean, everything about the hydrology of the site would change, which could also be for the better. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. maybe water levels are variable enough that Phragmites isn't as happy or thriving there. Um, yeah. Better maybe. access for turtles trying to cross the road to get to more wetland area. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just not sure of the unintended consequences. So that's all. That's just something that you know, for discussion later on. Yeah, yeah, I think those are great questions and concerns. Um, yeah, so it sounds like, Mickey, as much as you can be able to talk about kind of phasing and any understanding of like how that hydrology will be impacted, I think would be helpful. Um, okay, and, and then, you know, the, the other unanswered question is, I, I don't know um, how natural heritage is, what their comments will be. Um, yeah. The plans may have to change significantly um they may want an open space plan um that's an unknown so uh, I'll, okay. I'll let you know once we hear from them okay okay that sounds great thank you for taking the time to explain it now hopefully this has been helpful um commissioners any other questions or comments no, I would say that I really like the idea of not going in from the road there. I've been living in this area and around there for a long time. And the idea of that that particular roadway in, I've always objected to. So the idea they're coming in at a better location farther to the south, I really like. Great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Removal of that uh, of the driveway is awesome. I think it's yeah. Yeah. All right. Andres for it. Okay. All right. With that, then I think we probably need a motion to continue. Yes. And I'll get that up for you. Bear with me just one moment. Yeah. So we just I need a motion. I move to continue the public hearing for 395 West Street, notice of intent to 713 2022 at 745 p.m. Thanks, Larry. Second that. Who was that second? Was that you, Andre? Okay, yeah. voice yeah. vote. Larry. Aye. Andre. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Laura. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm also an aye. Okay, thank you all for your comments. That's very helpful. So we'll see you on the 13th. Okay, thanks, Mickey. Thank you, Tony and Ron. All right, moving along. Um, so next is an, our, our request for determination, an RDA in the Green Gardens Inc. on behalf of Stephen and Stacy Gordon for tree and vegetation removal at the riverfront area and buffer zone to BBW at 21 East Hadley Road. Um, do you know? I think it's Steve Viano. Um, Steve, could you? Yeah, okay. okay. He's there. All right. I'm just, let me get this open. Um, all right, so it looks like we're pretty close on this one. So, and I just wanna give the commissioners a quick, um, while Steve is coming on. So um, a couple months ago, earlier this year, there was um, an application for uh, very minor modifications to a home at 21 East Hadley Road. And in the course of that review, it was discovered that some trees had been removed without a permit. So this is a follow-up RDA following to address those. Andre, you were actually on the site visit with me, so you remember the site. Um, there are there's there's vegetation on the site additional vegetation they want to remove there's like a large bamboo patch there's some invasives there um so they'd like to do some additional work to remove that vegetation and then do some additional tree planting um so steve is here to explain the project and um i'll pull up the plans if steve needs me to share them and um as far as site visit i didn't actually schedule a site visit because we just like 
two and a half months ago had a site visit there, but um, I did add site visit photos to the OneDrive from our previous site visit. And if you guys would like, I can share those site visit, site visit photos um, during the hearing so you can see the site. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the plan. Steve, yep. are you there? I am. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, great. Thank you for being here. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you for uh, for hosting the meeting tonight. So um, essentially what we're looking to do over here is um, on the left hand side of the driveway at our client's property, they are looking to um, to remove additional vegetation and it's going to include removing, uh, I believe on here I have uh, four trees that are uh, that are of a little bit of a larger size. They Some of them had broken tops in them and some of them will become nuisances and some of them showed a little bit of rot. Um, that will be a problem in the future. And uh, so right on the um, the bottom corner of the uh, of this photo right here that um, that Aaron just pulled up. So that's essentially where all the trees and all the shrubbery is. So it's real more or less just overgrown. And um, what we want to do is we want to go in there. Um, we're going to clean out about 30 feet from their driveway worth of uh, worth of overgrown shrubs and then those four trees. And then what the plan is to then replant with about 30 um, native species of larger evergreen trees to then create a windbreak and a border between their property and their neighbor's property. Um, the tree sizes that we plan on putting back in there are going to be trees between six and 12 feet tall. So we're going to put some larger stuff back in there. Um, I am aware that that, uh, that bottom right hand corner of the property is also a flood zone area. So what we're going to do to mitigate all of the um, any potential um, silt or sediment wash away is we're going to extend the current um, the current area of uh, um, of the silt sock that uh, is already going across East Hadley Road. Um, we're going to extend that along the other two thirds of the property, which um, then would uh, would serve as a way to if there does happen to be a lot of rain or anything that would wash away a lot of the sediment. Um, that would capture that. And um, after we remove all the trees and shrubs that are uh, currently in the area, what we want to do is then stabilize the property as well with um, with uh, erosion control grass until we're able to then plant. Um, right now, we're planning on planting this upcoming fall, so probably September uh, plant date. And uh, we're finishing finalizing plans right now on the uh, landscaping for the rest of the property as well. And um, there's also a bamboo patch that's near the shed in the back of the property that's um, not yet encroaching on the wetlands, but though it seems to that it will be um, in the near future. So we also want to remove that bamboo patch to, um, to, to keep that from invading the neighboring wetlands. And uh, um, as for the rest of the property, once construction is complete on the house, we plan on then um, real landscaping everything with a lot, with a, heavy focus on, on native and pollinator planting. And then um, I've also been talking with the homeowner as well about potentially removing the current asphalt driveway that they have. And then we were planning on putting in a, um, a permeable driveway, most likely a crushed stone driveway. Okay. Aaron, did you have any outstanding comments or concerns about this? plan? Um, I do have some recommended conditions. Um, just try to zoom in on those a little bit. Um, and I can also share site visit photos if that's useful. But uh, I definitely would like to inspect the erosion controls prior to earthwork and vegetation removal. Um, I want the limits of work clearly marked particularly pertaining to the wetland areas. I don't want any encroachment into wetlands um, with the work that's being done, um, machinery or trimming or anything um, for work in wetland areas. Um, that there should be somebody who's assigned as a monitor on the site to make sure that the plan is being followed and that people aren't sort of going off the rails and taking out um, vegetation that shouldn't be removed and that that person should provide their name and contact information and basically be assigned as responsible for making sure the plan is followed. Um, site 
be fully stabilized and that I would like to come out and sign off before erosion controls are removed. Um, I also would like to inspect the plantings once they're installed um, to verify that the plantings have been installed as per the um, proposed plan. 50% uh, success over a three-year period for plantings um, and that no fill is placed in the flood zone on the southeast corner of the lot. So those were sort of the conditions that I had spelled out and I can also pull up photos. So this is the bamboo patch on the left that you can see. This is facing the wetland. Um, so these are house photos. These were relative to the, the house that was the work that was done around the house, but it gives you a sense of what um, the existing vegetation looks like on the site. This is across the street is the Fort River. So you can see the site is pretty, you know, there's, there are, there's not a lot of vegetation on the site right now. Um, it seems as though they're sort of removing all the vegetation and just replanting everything. Um, are these, are all of these trees proposed for removal, Steve, that are uh, currently? No, none of those trees that are there on the street. So where the photo is being taken from, there's just mm -hmm. four trees that we're gonna remove, but all the trees that are behind that, that are near the property line, we're gonna, we're gonna leave. And then there's okay. also a few big trees that are next to the driveway that we're also going to leave. So we're only taking down four. There's only four trees coming down. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I just wanted to give the commission a refresher of what the site looked like so that you were familiar with it. But um, that those are my comments and the photos. Okay. Michelle, did you have any questions or concerns? I was just wondering what the um, large native evergreens you were going to plant were, what species? Yep, so we're planning on using a, a pretty wide mix. So we're gonna use um, cedar, white pine, uh, Norway spruce. Um, uh, we're gonna use some arborvitae possibly. And- So arborvitae and Norway spruce aren't native. So, I mean, that was one of the things you said, are we, are we requiring them to be native plantings in that order of condition? Well, the that's completely up to you guys to, you know, if you guys want to, to say they should all be natives, then absolutely. Um, um, what are the, the trees that to... are being, yeah, what are the trees that are being taken down, the big trees? So the trees taken down, um, one of them's a willow, and then I believe the other three are red maples. And then I would also be able to then, um, use other other varieties of spruce and stuff like that I can look into as well for the uh for the for the uh proposed uh new windbreak I mean I know that in my yard um Norway spruce is pretty nasty and is kind of taking over so I'd I'd prefer to see native plantings to replace the native cuts mm -hmm. so yeah, like this, the cedar and white pine it sounds like are more favorable than the Norway spruce and arborvitae yeah, and juniper is probably an option too, but um, yeah, not Norway spruce and arborvitaes. Also, just I mean, red maple, swamp maple sounds like it's a very wet site. I don't know if white pine will be as happy, so it might be worth looking into some evergreens or conifers that are happier in super wet environments. Hemlocks come to mind, but that's a certain acquired taste, so worth considering, Steve. Yep, definitely, thank you. Yeah. Laura, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to get some clarity on the um, conditions. So, um, uh, Aaron, you were saying the site must be monitored daily during work operations by an, basically an assigned uh, individual. Are you asking them to send you photos during the work or um, how do you intend on monitoring that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> That's a great question, Laura. I wasn't going to require monitoring reports. Mostly what I wanted was somebody who was going to be supervising the work while it's underway so that it's because my observation is that when um, there's landscaping going on and tree removal going on on a site or and or shrub removal going on on a site that sometimes 
um, crews that are working on a given site. Um, a supervisor might leave and they might say, oh, we'll take this too and we'll take this too and they'll start to move into areas that are not approved to be worked in. Um, so my thought is to, on this particular site, make sure that somebody is assigned to be in charge and supervising to ensure that those areas aren't crossed and also to have um, some type of limit of work established that could be like orange construction fencing or something um, that it may it could just be the erosion controls but basically that it's clear when I go out there to do my erosion control inspection this is a line that we're not going beyond for mm -hmm. any of the vegetation removal and the tree removal yeah no I was going to say I agree with you that sometimes um you know when you have crews on site sometimes the message doesn't always flow down so I would suggest if it's if it's something we've asked for before just Sort of somewhat regular photos being sent to you so you can ensure that the work is being done properly i don't know if that's too much work for you i'm not adding is that too much then? okay no um, I, I think that's a great suggestion um, what i was gonna say is um so i think to strike kind of an in middle ground here since this is a single home on a pretty small residential lot mm -hmm. that may be a very clear demarcation of the limit of work um steve if you think that that's feasible and it could correspond with kind of the erosion controls it sounds like but something that just makes it very clear where clearing is happening and that is like the only area that clearing is happening and if you can just document that with some photos you don't I think any kind of daily monitoring is a little bit um too onerous here is my instinct um but I do hear the concerns that sometimes um it can be work work sites can spread a little bit so Steve would you be all right with just making sure it's very clear where the limits of work are on the site and just documenting with photos when you can Yep, definitely. I think that's very fair. And then um, I had a question in terms of the person that's the supervisor that's more or less in charge of making sure that nobody on the crew or, or anybody else um, goes past those limits. Is that somebody that uh, would be somebody from you guys or would that be somebody that's uh, it could be somebody in my own crew that I could assign to be able to um, take care of that? So we were talking about somebody in your own crew, but oh, I could definitely do that. Yep. Even just um, emailing from your from their phone or whatever photos to Aaron um, can be helpful just so we know what's going on, but we don't need a required like report or increment, just documenting um, is great. Any, okay. any communication is super appreciated. Great, I'll go and yeah, I'll definitely mark all that out tomorrow and then I'll uh, coordinate with Aaron to be able to do a site visit and whatnot and go over the final plans. Okay, great. Laura, is that okay? Does that sound good? She might have had to step away for a second. Um, all right, so commissioners, any further questions or comments? Steve, does that order of conditions make sense to you? Yep, definitely. So to uh, just go over it again, um, um, Aaron's gonna come out and inspect all of our flood control measures after we're, um, after we're finished putting them in, um, uh, mark the limit of work, um, no encroachment past those areas, and um, have a site monitor that's going to be sending uh, Aaron um, pretty regular photos of, of the progress on the site. Yep. And then um, the entire site should be fully stabilized and inspected by Aaron upon completion of work mm -hmm. um, so that she can sign off at the um, on the permit at the close of the project. Um, and then upon completion of plantings, Aaron must inspect to confirm trees were planted and stalls as proposed. Um, trees 50% successful over a three year period. Um, that was her proposed kind of like plan to make sure that there's some sort of stabilization there. Mm -hmm. um, no fill placed in the flood zone and native plantings. Perfect. Yeah, I could definitely make sure all that gets done. Okay. And Aaron, this will be in the permit language. So um, you will have all of this in writing, Steve. You don't have to remember it all at this moment. Awesome. Thank um, you. I see. Andre, did you have one more question or comment? Uh, yes, just as uh, I, I reiterate uh, Michelle's concern about the native uh, species, and you just mentioned them. Now, Steve, when uh, uh, when Steve was talking earlier about uh, planting, native, uh, plant, uh, planting the uh, other trees there, um, 
mentioned that they were native species, but then when he started to enumerate uh, or list uh, the species, uh, there were the two uh, that were not native. I, I think um, maybe a uh, listing of uh, what trees they are, or maybe uh, defining the fact, uh, defining which ones are native and not, uh, so that Steve can uh, stay within that, those, uh, within those sideboards of uh, what he had mentioned earlier. Great, yeah, so we've added native plantings to the conditions. And so Aaron, would you be comfortable just reviewing the final list of plantings um, at the initial kickoff meeting, um, just to make sure that I'm, I'm confident that Steve can use resources available to find native mm -hmm. species, but just a review of that, Aaron. Okay, I'm seeing a nod. Yes. Great. Yeah, I just, yeah, putting in um, those non-native uh, evergreens probably wouldn't make it there anyway if it's that wet. So yeah, it'll work to everyone's benefit, hopefully, Steve. Um, okay, it's quite a, quite a list of conditions. We appreciate you coming to us with this, Steve. Um, and commissioners, any other comments or questions? I'm just looking to make sure I see any nodding. Looks good. Okay, so it looks like, I don't think we need to read through all the conditions again, but um, if someone could just reference the, the previously discussed conditions and give us a motion, that would be fantastic. I move to close public hearing and issue positive determination checking box five, and negative determination checking box two with required conditions noted above and discussed. Mm -hmm. All right, so motion from Michelle, second from Laura, voice vote, Michelle. Aye. Laura. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Larry. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I'm also aye. All right, Steve, good luck out there. Thank all right, you. great, thank you all. Have a good night. You too. Uh, Oh, I didn't take public comment. No one will um, Yeah, if anyone here is in attendance for that hearing, I apologize if I didn't ask. If anyone has any questions or comments relevant to this hearing at 21 East Hadley Road, please raise your hand. Apologies. That was my fault too. I should have been queuing in that. Well, my fault. You're I don't see anyone. You're going to get a bad review. <laughs> Tough crowd, tough crowd. All right. Um, it doesn't look like anyone. Again, apologies. If you have any questions or comments relevant to that um, application, please raise your hand. I think you're good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Notice of intent. I think this is our last one because 51 Spalding is another is going to continue again. Um, so last hearing, Stantec on behalf of Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation for widening and resurfacing a portion of the Norwatuck Rail Trail in riverfront area bordering land subject to flooding and buffer zone isol to isolated vegetated wetlands at zero station road. Um, so who would be here from Stantec? It looks like Paul and Elise, is that right? Yep. Okay, let me open the hearing. Could you okay. also, um, Lisa Carosta is also here from Stantec and she'll oh, be yeah. presenting as well. Thank you. Okay, yep. Lisa, you should be able to talk. Okay, let me open the hearing. This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended and article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. Um, yeah, so welcome Elise, Lisa and Paul. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind introducing yourselves and then if you would be willing to give us like a four to five minute kind of overview of the project and the application, that would be great. Yeah, great. Hi, this is Paul Janagy. I'm a trail planner with the Department of Conservation and Recreation. I am here with uh, Lisa D'Onofrio and Lisa Carosa from Stantec. Um, 
And I want to thank the commission for having us and uh, for the uh, opportunity to, to be remote. I, I will say this is the first conservation commission I've attended where I haven't been allowed to be a panelist as a presenter. So that's a little distracting, but I um, appreciate being able to be here. Um, so uh, again, I'm trail planner for Department of Conservation and Recreation. We are owner of half of this section of the rail trail it goes from Station Road to Warren Wright Road. This is the section that was not reconstructed back in 2014 or so when our other 11 miles uh, through Amherst were reconstructed. Um, so this is a project with MassDOT to reconstruct this final mile and a half to Warren Wright Road. Um, it is a reconstruction. It uh, also involves um, uh, widening uh, to bring it to the standards uh, of the other sections of the rail trail and meet the current AASHTO standards. Um, and then also a few uh, amenities and, and, and whatnot, um, some um, mile markers and things like that. And I will turn it over to Lisa to sort of get into a little bit of the, the well and filing piece. Sure, Aaron, um, if you wouldn't call up the plans. I, I'm think... having trouble hearing you, Lisa. Oh. You. I, I guess I'm a little confused. You guys aren't able to share, um, and I'm more than happy to to share the plans. But it it seems a little weird tonight. Like people Here can't we go. present. Here we go. Wait, let's try this. I just tried something new. Okay. Usually, people are able to yeah be panelists and present fine and i'm more than happy to pull up the plans to make it easy for you guys if we need if you need me to i just wanted to okay. make sure you had that ability if you wanted okay. to well, Lisa, you should you so should be I'm able now, to share yes now i have full screen now i need to be able to that was share weird screen, sorry about that it's easier it's it might be my fault That's i okay. when, we're when we're taking public comment i allow people to talk okay. versus mm -hmm. turning them into panelists so i think i just did my default allowing people to talk instead of turning you into a panelist. So I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So can you hear me now and see my screen? Yes. Okay. Oh, we can't see your screen. We see you. You can't see my screen. Okay. <laughs> there we go. It's coming up now. There we go. Okay, so you should see a USGS map. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. So, okay. So as Paul mentioned, this project um, in Amherst, it's one and a half miles between Station Road and then all the way through the Belcher Town to Warren Wright Road. And the piece that we're working on in Amherst is just over a mile. It's 1.1 miles. And as you can see, it's uh, right alongside the, the Montague River and um, Lawrence Swamp. So you can see it right here in an aerial view. So this is going to be a what we call a full depth reconstruction. The existing path right now is eight and a half feet wide, and we're going to widen it to 10 feet. And that's similar to the piece that's in um, Belcher Town already. So it'll make it consistent. So if we start in on the plans. That one is even too far, but I know um, sometimes it, it's helpful. So this is Station Road right here. This is the beginning of the project. And we have a series of bordering vegetated wetlands associated with this Lawrence Swamp. And then we also have it uh, both on both sides of the trail. So we have BBW uh, for the most part along this section, the first section. There's some reason for I need to find my toolbar. Oh, here we are. Okay. Then this next section is very similar. We're in the 100 foot buffer zone. The wetlands are shown in blue on, on both sides of the existing path. We go a little further down. We're still in the buffer zone with this increased path. And this, this stipple pattern you see here, we're um, installing sediment controls along basically along the lake of um, the portion of the trail that's facing the wetland on either side. So I know there are no landmarks along here, so it's just basically by mile. So then we get into this section of the trail where we have um, watering land subject to flooding. It's probably better shown on this plan. 
so it kind of cuts in and out of this uh, of the rail trail and there's no assigned elevation it's just an a zone so because it's just an a zone we don't have the e zone um human in a published yet or did the studies um, we basically did a cut and fill analysis in the flood zone and we actually came out with a net increase in flood storage by the time we um, create these, these shoulders. So we're actually creating flood storage in the flood zone. Next here, you'll see a little bit. So this is one area where there is an existing culvert, oops, an existing culvert at station 128 where the stones have become dislodged. And basically it's a maintenance project. Um, so BCR elected to um, add that work to this contract. So we think this can be accomplished um, on foot by a worker down on the side of the, of the trail um, with equipment working from the trail itself, guiding those stones back into place. And we call out for provisions for sediment control there um, in case there are flows and it gets a little um, mucked up from the foot traffic. But we do expect only foot traffic though. Uh, so continuing on with little bits and pieces of the flood zone intruding into the, the current and proposed um, layout. So it continues on and then we have um, we're just in the buffer zone again, the BBW. I think that's the end of the flood zone work, if you will. This one actually go on. At least you have these realized. I don't <laughs> plan sheets. Uh, here we go. So this is the end of the line. So there's just that one stretch basically in the middle where we're in the flood zone. We also have a riverfront um, that was estimated because that river is such a vast system. So we estimated the riverfront area, which does extend onto um, the rail trail. We have, um, uh, for the record, the impacts to the riverfront are 4,943 square feet. The majority of that is temporary, just the physical work within the flood zone and permanent increase in impervious surface from that um, increased width is going to be 978 uh, square feet. And I think I mentioned the watering lanes that are flooding, there's a net, there will be a net increase in flood storage in the flood zone of um, 1,315 uh, cubic feet. So we do have select um, tree uh, removal along the way. Um, and that is to make sure that those shoulders are um, compatible with the rail trail. And I believe there's going to be an, um, an arborist is going to go out um, prior to construction to inventory those trees and to mark them so that obviously only trees that need to come down will come down. So with that, I can open it up to questions. You know, I'll just land somewhere here where it's Okay, this is, a, this is a typical section through here. Uh, so if you have any questions, a lot to take in. Do you guys Thanks. want me to share site visit photos? Yeah, I think the next move, if it's okay, just so we can get a sense for it. Um, if you could just talk about the site visit, Erin. Yeah, sorry, I thought I had it queued up and ready to go. I don't know why. Uh, thought I already opened them. Where are you? Sorry. Yes, I, I did. Sorry about that, guys. Bear with me just a second. Well, Aaron's pulling that up, <sighs> I guess I can chime in a little bit. Yeah, please um, do, because I just yeah. lost my remote computer. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so Paul Janagi, myself, and then um, another colleague that helped with the permitting, Lori, went out there and we met with Erin. We had staked out the limits of work along the corridor, um, essentially showing where the seating limits would go. I'm not sure if anyone made it out there after the site visit, but we had painted some white marks 
along the trail and we had a couple stakes in there with white ribbon that denoted the limits of work to show that the limits the contractor would be in would be within the existing footprint. Um, previously in design, we had gone out there with DCR's arborist and identified trees that should be removed that are either causing root damage or again would be too close to the shoulder for the widening. Um, so those trees are labeled on the plans that we anticipate for removal based on that initial visit, um, as well as trees that we want to retain. Um, and then the idea would be to have an arborist go out there with DCR's arborist initially as well um, before construction. Thank you, Elise, for yeah, no covering for me there. Um, I just, just to jump back to the um, site visit photo. So the uh, this is just a, a site visit photo showing um, you can see where the, the wetland flag is located here, and you can also see the stake that shows the limit of work line. Um, and just to, to recap, it's, could you guys just say it's, it's existing eight feet and going to 10 feet? Is that right? It's about it's, eight and a half feet now. Yeah. And yeah. we're, we're putting it to 10 feet so that it matches the remaining 11 miles that have already been widened. And, and then also, the Belcher, oh, go ahead, Paul. Well, just to clarify, the stakes yeah. are on the limit of work, not the limit of paving. Yes. So the limit right. of paving is, is narrower than that. Right. So it's about a foot on each side of the bike path that it's extending over. And then the, the seating area will extend over to where those white stakes are. Um, it, it's pretty, I mean, I didn't really have any major concerns about the work as it's proposed. Um, it's clear that the surfacing of this area, like you can see in, just in the short walk that we took, there's like these huge um, root systems that are um, growing up into the bike path that make it difficult, the surface difficult to ride on. Um, there, uh, there's some areas of disturbance look like turtles digging. Also, like this is this is the area that um, Lisa was referencing, and <laughs> it's absolutely frightening this structure that's here so it's a culvert that goes under the bike path and this is, looks like a man-made beaver deceiver of some sort that was installed out here and it's like this cage around the inlet of the culvert and so they're pulling all of this out and re-armoring the inlet to this um this culvert so i think I see that there would be a lot of, even though there is a, a slight increase in impervious um, associated with the bike path widening, that number one, I believe it's a limited project because it's a um, multi-use path. Also, um, it's the resource area improvements being the net benefit in flood storage, as well as this situation <laughs> getting cleaned up, I think is great. Um, so I just wanted to, to put that out there as, as my comments. And then um, I do have some suggested um, conditions for this permit as well. Um, and I'll just pull, pull those up on my screen, but we did talk about them um, in the field and Bear with me just one second. I want to make sure I don't close out my um, remote machine on you again. Uh, here we go. Uh, so, so the standard boilerplate conditions that we would use, which are standard for, for all of our local permits and state permits, um, erosion control inspection at the start of work by the wetlands administrator, pre-construction meeting with DCR wetlands administrator, um, and the selected contractor required prior to the start of work. A contact list um, that has the supervisors uh, that are in charge of the construction project, their name and phone numbers, as well as a um, estimated project timeline from you know breaking ground to stabilization. So we have a general sense of of the um, timetable for the project. Um, identify a material stockpile location outside of conservation commission jurisdiction. Um, we discussed this also weekly inspections to be completed during the construction phase of the work, but monthly monitoring reports to be submitted during the construction phase to the Conservation Commission Wetlands Administrator. Um, inspections to be completed by uh, DCR and an informal email just sent to us uh, with a few photos and comments that might notate necessary repairs or comments on the condition of the siltation fence um, along the project limits. 
upon final stabilization and inspection by the wetlands administrator. Um, and then the just the final comment is um, final inspection step can't be skipped here because the erosion and sediment controls, unless they're 100% biodegradable, shouldn't just be left in place. Um, other than that, I, I really don't have any concerns on this project. It's very straightforward, well put together, and I think that um, they've put together some good mitigation strategy. Okay, thank you everyone for that incredible amount of detail. Um, Dave, do you have a question right out of the bat here, or clarification? Excuse me, no, I just wanted to add that um, I've been working with Paul and Elise for months on this. Uh, we, we, of course, the, the rail trail um, from Station Road to Warren Rye Road does go through um, our, our water supply protection area, and we've been working closely with Guilford Mooring and his team uh, down at DPW. The one thing I, I guess I would ask Aaron is whether in that order of conditions, whether it would be appropriate to put something about just notification. I, I, would, I would want DPW to be kind of notified and kept in the loop on any notifications coming to the conservation department. Um, and, and again, we've had great communication with, with uh, Stantec and, and Paul throughout the whole process of getting to this point, but I just think it would be good to have interdepartmental um, you know, communication going on since DPW will want to be, you know, on the ground out there, the engineering team or the water department to make sure everything goes smoothly as, as the resurfacing happens down on the uh, eastern edge, if Paul and Elise are fine with that. That's great. And Dave, do you want to include them on the pre-construction and then to receive monitoring reports as well? Do you think those would right. be good? I think that would be great. I mean, it's okay. as simple as just one one more email, you know, yep. to send it to. And and I think, you know, uh, it behooves us all to just make sure everything is going well. And if there's any questions, you know, DPW Water or DPW Engineering, you know, is five minutes away. So Great. Thanks, Dave. Does that yeah, make I sense? Did. Anyone, uh, yeah, Dave, I'll just let you know, because we, we um, had submitted um, kind of final plans to MassDOT for final review as we're simultaneously finishing up the permitting. And I did add some upfront, similar to what Aaron and I had talked about in the field, about just having some more language in the specifications and special provisions to make sure that CONCOM is notified, make sure that access is maintained for our DPW and to contact Guilford. I put his name and number in there a couple of times. So hopefully <laughs> having it multiple places, it will not be missed. <laughs> Good. And yeah, you sent me an email just the other day with the plans yeah. and I, of course, forwarded that on to Guilford and, you know, Great. it is, it is a very important area for us as it, as it relates to our well field. So, uh, yeah, we'll just take all precautions and make sure lines of communication are maintained throughout the project. Great. Great. Commissioner, does anyone have any questions or concerns? Seeing a lot of no's. All right. Then I think... Uh, uh, oh, real quick, Andre. Yep. Um, I won't be able to vote because I work for DCR. Okay, got it. And we should take public comment on this one. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you, Erin. Um, members of the public, thank you for joining us if you're here and have any questions or comments about this particular hearing, about the improvements to the rail trail from station, uh, starting at Station Road, heading towards Belchertown. Raise your hand. Not seeing any. All right. So I think with that, um, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind sharing the draft motion, um, Aaron did thoroughly read through all these conditions. So if a commissioner is willing to make a motion and just reference the previously noted conditions, that would be great. Commissioners, anyone willing to make a motion? I can make a motion, sorry, okay. just tiny on my screen. So I'll make a motion to move to issue the order of conditions DCR for zero station road bike path widening DEP number 
081-0702 with noted conditions above. Second. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I think I had Michelle on the second. Um, okay, voice vote. Uh, ooh, sorry. Um, Michelle. Aye. Andre. Abstain. Oh, thanks. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm also an I. All right. Lisa, Paul, Elise, thank you for being here. And um, thank the commission. And um, thank you. best of luck out there. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Forward to it. Bye. I'm just trying to. There we go. All right. That's everyone. All right, uh, one more hearing, but this is just a continuance, right, Erin? Yes, yep. Okay, all right, so we just need a motion to continue the hearing at 51 Spalding Street. I move to continue the public hearing for 51 Spalding Street to July 13th, 2022 at 7.35 p.m. Second. Seconded by Andre, voice vote, Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Laura. Aye. Larry. Did I lose Larry? Larry's gone. Hmm. Oh, he's somehow in attendees. Hmm. I didn't do that. that was <laughs> Uh, Larry, are you back? Well, I'm also an I. Not sure. I vote yes. I vote yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Larry. I saw it, but I couldn't say anything. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's the end of hearings. Um, yes. Let's see so other business i'm just looking at the, oh there you go okay so it sounds like we have a certificate of compliance aaron yes yeah it's like it's from uh the early 90s i went out and looked at the site the site's stable i think it's completely fine to issue a certificate of compliance on okay great so we just need a motion commissioners Move to issue a certificate of compliance for 63 Woodlot Road, DP, file number 0890323 with ongoing required conditions as applicable. Second. second. I had Michelle in the second. Voice vote, Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. And I'm an aye. All right. So um, I want to be just put out there before we jump into this discussion. Um, I don't want to discuss the SORAD at all, um, the content of it, commissioner opinions on it, none of that. Um, basically, what I just I'd just like to present a couple facts to you guys just to give you some background and see where you guys stand relative to scheduling um, a meeting early next week for a executive session to discuss this. So um, back in November of 2021, the Conservation Commission denied um, a order of resource area delineation uh, for 52 Faring Street. Um, there was the issues with the delineation were relative to the wetland delineation and we had had a third party peer review Emily Stockman had done the um, review and found issues with the wetland delineation as well as um, there was a review of the watershed area relative to the perennial versus intermittent status of the tan brook DEP issued a superseding order of resource area delineation on the property um, this past Thursday. The timing could not have been worse for a variety of reasons. Uh, the 
Thursday night prior to a holiday weekend when we already had a chock full agenda the following Wednesday and a special meeting already scheduled within a week of this meeting, um, which means that and and also the deadline for um, appeal submission to DEP is for all intents and purposes on June 30th. So that means even if we discussed it at our special meeting a week from today, it doesn't give us enough time to prepare a written appeal to DEP on the matter within a day. Um, so I think that the question is, do commissioners want to schedule a special meeting on Monday or Tuesday to schedule an executive session to discuss the SORAD and the commission's position relative to whether they want to appeal DEP's decision. Um, by way of just giving a snapshot, DEP deemed, D, DEP did not support the commission's um, determination, deemed um, the Tanbrook to be intermittent, not perennial as the commission had determined, and um, approved the commission's wetland delineation. So um, the finding was contrary to uh, the commission's decision. And so the, the question is, would you like to schedule an executive session to review their findings and or to make a decision relative to whether the commission would like to consider an appeal of the permit? I would say yes, simply. From my point of view, I think it's uh, something that we should be discussing to see where where we're going to take it uh, quickly. Are there commissioners? <clears throat> I would meet. That was simple. I think it's worthwhile de dealing with it. As would I. Um, I would love it if it wasn't at seven. Um, it doesn't have to be. Seven. It could okay. be any time. It could be any time of the day. Um, we just need to post it, and I need to get a, an agenda posted for us. But week, the agenda we? can have only uh, an executive session, right, Aaron? Correct. Okay. Go ahead, Laura. Laura. Sorry. This is this is just this is for next week, Aaron. Yes. So, and just for context, next week we have a special meeting scheduled on the 29th. Um, at seven o'clock to discuss the land use policy and zero Tuckerman. So this would need to be need to be Monday or Tuesday. And um, I think we don't need a ton of time to talk, but we you, do need. You should um, ask Fletcher. I am out all next week. OK. I mean, um, Leroy is, is out, so we would need Fletcher. Jen, are you available Monday or yeah, Tuesday? I am available Monday or Tuesday. I think my preference would be earlier um, in the week just to give more time if we move in the direction of an appeal. Um, one other procedural question, Aaron. Can multiple parties appeal? Yes. OK. Okay. Um, so the question becomes what time, and let's look at Monday. Let's start with Monday and say what time. I can tell you I will not be available until 11 o'clock um, to do any executive session on Monday. Uh, after 11 a.m., I am available until 3 o'clock, and then um, my preference at that point would probably be 7 just putting out my schedule and availability for you guys and see what other folks looks like. Yeah, so I'm in the field, which sucks, but I can like drive to cell service um, if it's the middle of the work day. Um, I mean, I said I didn't want to do seven, but if that's what's easiest for people, I think after work is probably easier for me. Um, yeah, it's hard. Um, My only conflict is at two o'clock for one hour. 
Andre, who's your? Yeah, I work 10 to six, but I can, um, I can, uh, there's some flexibility in, uh, in what I could do uh, during that time. So I'll make sure that I'm within cell service and uh, whatever time it is. Could I propose a noon lunch hour meeting on Monday? 12 noon? Can you do that, the... Jen? If you're in the field and you have to like stop what you're doing and go get cell service, that's, yeah, I don't kind know. Of... I could yeah. go wrong. Um, I forget what site we're going. I'll just to take back. I can totally do seven. <laughs> I'm just really tired at the moment. Six? Yeah, I know. I know. Um, what about or six thirty? What about uh, is six better, Michelle? Well, Andre works till six. Andre, do you work from home? I mean, do you need like a buffer? I'm. Uh, I'm. I work only ten minutes from home, so uh, uh, six fifteen, six thirty. Does or, that get uh, any better for you, Michelle, or is that the same as seven? I mean, it, it was just a personal preference. Seven's fine. If, if seven's yeah. good for Aaron, seven's good for Andre, if it works for you, I'll, I can do seven. I'm sorry. Next, is it okay if next time, I'm not usually in the field, but in this case, it's like <laughs> out of my control and I have no cell service. Well, if, um, if, if that is what works, then that's what we do. The other question is, will we have a quorum? So Yeah, we, so we'll need Fletcher, like basically the, this this we need Fletcher to be able to do this too right um so Aaron would you mind just emailing or I I can't email him so if you yeah I'll you check can... in with Fletcher I'll check in with yeah. Fletcher and okay. um I'll check in with Fletcher first thing tomorrow morning um and I might just call Fletcher and um in first thing in the morning and let him know what's going on um sure. but right now it looks like 7 p.m on monday we'd have an executive session um and that would be at seven o'clock so monday june 27th 7 p.m i'd say 7 to 8 p.m would be we'd keep it tight keep it succinct and um and basically that will be that and we can have a quick conversation about it um and uh i can do you know i can do the footwork so we just need to kind of get a sense from people what their feelings are on it um i forwarded you guys the decision if anybody wants any additional documents uploaded for review please let me know i can do that um, but we will need a motion um and i'll just i'm just going to plug in so let's Let's really hope that Fletcher can make Monday <laughs> 627. Uh, Do you want to, could we say, is there any way we can give ourselves, like, could we say move to schedule an executive session on 627 or 628 at this point, Aaron, or can we not do that? Well, the, um, only, the only issue is she's got to make a public notification. We can do that, and then she can. I know, it and that'll be okay. Um, yeah. Okay, let's 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 do that, Jen. Let's say six twenty-seven or or six twenty-eight, um, twenty-two at seven p.m. Uh, and. I'll check with Fletcher and see number one, if he's available either of those days or times. Yeah. And if he is, then I will schedule the executive session and I'll send you guys an email and confirm. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right, team. We're just looking for this motion. I move to schedule an executive session. Pursuant to GLC 30A section 21A3 to discuss the strategy with respect to litigation at 52 Faring Street regarding recently issued DEP SORAD um, on 627, 22, or 628, 22 at 7 p.m. Second. Yeah. I got Larry on the second. So voice vote, Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Leroy. Uh, Leroy. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm also an I. Silence. Okay. All right. What other business items 
that's that's all I've got for you this evening. Uh, okay. I think that's enough. Um, you guys really the fact that we wrapped this by 909 like you guys I mean good job and thank you so much for your focused tonight. This was really good. <laughs> we yeah. really did a good job getting through this crazy agenda. Thanks everyone and Leroy. Well, we're gonna miss you buddy <laughs> do you want to do the, do you want to do the the final your final uh uh adjournment here Leroy here all right that's a good one I move to adjourn this meeting at 9 11 6 22 22. second uh voice vote Michelle oh you're muted <laughs> Hi, and it was nice working with you, Leroy. Right. Andre. Hi. Take care, Leroy. Thank you for everything. Larry. Hi. Laura. Laura. Hi. And Laura. I'm an I, Leroy. I Good luck with future adventures. You live on through our bylaws. <laughs> yes yes <laughs> good job thank you so much I know. all right bye guys um, Aaron, bye. i have one quick question for you yeah i'll stay on okay so i'm cc'd on all these emails with the 52 fairing street like a butter yeah a butter. yeah um, i'm sorry that was a a real um uh I'm not sure why that even happened because yeah. that, that was a blind copy on my email that I sent. So I'm not sure like what the heck is going on with that. Wait, um, somebody probably added me, but I can't discuss this no, with no, them. Right. No, okay. No, no. So no. should I, I'm going to, should I reply and ask to be removed? <clears throat> um, you can. Uh, the other thing is I'm going to be speaking to somebody tomorrow on on the a butter end. So I'll make mm -hmm. I'll make sure that it's clear that, um, you know, that was a I'm not sure why that happened. And but it was an error and that um, to make sure that commissioners are not included on those emails. OK, yeah, that was, awesome. that was yeah and not, I'm not doing anything. Yeah. Nope. Uh, that was, yeah. I'm not sure it's, what happened was I was forwarding that on because it came in late Thursday night and I was trying to forward it to everybody. And in my blind copy that with the town outlook, it's really weird. And I plugged everybody in as a blind copy, but for some reason, yeah, it seems that it oh. didn't function properly in the blind copy function. Oh, yeah. and everybody was in there and I'm like, what the heck? It's no problem. People also dig up my email and just CC me somehow all the yeah. time. Yeah. 